Hey, it's Ivan from the EV Stock Channel here, and I want to first start off by saying I am extremely bullish on SpaceX and Starlink. And if Starlink does an IPO, I will be one of the first to invest. However, there are two massive risks for a company that is launching satellites into space. So to help shed some light on this topic, I'll be interviewing Tony Darnell from Deep Astronomy. But before we begin, I'd first like to thank each and every Patreon for making these episodes possible, along with Bradford Ferguson from Holt Up Ferguson Financial. And remember, everything mentioned is our opinion only and not financial advice. So let's get into it. I was just wondering if you can briefly discuss what the Kessler effect is and your thoughts on it. All right, so the Kessler effect basically just describes what would happen in a crowded Earth orbit environment when lots of stuff is up there in orbit over our heads. If they, if what would happen if they start bumping into each other, right? If two satellites collided, the debris from that satellite collision might uh, spew out other pieces of debris and go out and hit other nearby satellites, causing them to create more debris, get them off course, smash into other satellites. And before you know it, you've got this cascading mess on your hands where one collision created thousands of other smaller of other collisions, damaging a good percentage of the orbital property that's up there. The Kessler effect just is, is just a name for that. It just describes this cascading failure of collisions because everything's so crowded up there. And, and, and something uh, like that, um, hasn't occurred as a cascade. There have been collisions, but there haven't been uh, a cascading effect like that yet because of the, uh, I think the density of what's up there isn't great enough for that to happen. But if you think about it, if you think about it, if you get enough stuff up there close enough together, it's bound to happen. If just one thing goes wrong, right? Some hydrogen, hydrazine thruster gets stuck and pushes one aircraft out of where it's supposed to be into some other some other trajectory that causes it to collide with other stuff that could create a real problem. And yeah. this is becoming more and more of an issue. Yeah. Cause it seems so unpredictable. Like if you were to have a collision, the speed at which satellites are moving and like a collision, you just don't know where those pieces are, are going. Right. It, it depends entirely on the mechanics of the collision itself, right? You, you have a nice, uh, it's like billiard balls, you know, you hit, mm -hmm. you hit them into a crowded field of a, a table of balls. I mean, yes, you can use Newtonian mechanics to predict what'll happen, but it's not an easy calculation to make on the fly. And you're not going to be able to know, um, as it's happening, what, what's going to be affected you need for things to kind of settle down after the fact and get the new trajectories of all the pieces of debris to find out what's going to be affected in the future but as it's happening you're not going to be able to know and it is hard to predict yeah and as i've seen in your videos you've mentioned that it's not just spacex and starlink that are putting satellites in space you've got blue origin amazon mm -hmm. facebook all these other uh, companies doing the same thing yeah everybody wants in on the act i mean uh SpaceX is the biggest. They want to put up up to 42,000 satellites with Starlink uh, to and provide internet. And how many do we have at the moment in orbit? You know, a few thousand uh, yep. satellites in Earth, Earth orbit. And the, the most popular real estate is the height above the Earth where it matches the rotation of the Earth. That's called geosynchronous orbits. That's where people like to put a lot of communication satellites, things like DirecTV and, and uh, BBC and ITV and all these places like to put their satellites in a place where it can stay over one spot in the Earth. And that's a very popular spot. Okay. So we've mentioned the Kessler effect. Can you talk about solar flares? Because we've had an event such as the Carrington event. Maybe you can just touch on that and talk about what effect that, that would have on satellites. Right. So um, the sun at its heart is a magnetic star. It is highly active magnetically. It's got a very strong magnetic field um, and it has and this magnetic field has a cycle of about 11 years, 11 years, every 11 years, it gets very, very active and then it goes down and becomes very quiescent uh, during its active phase during solar max. Uh, the sun is creating and spewing out large amounts of material um, in the form of coronal mass ejections. 
These are magnetic eruptions that can go off in any direction and with it taking lots of charged particles and plasma. But the magnetic fields are very, very strong in these eruptions. Now, the Carrington event happened sometime in the 19th century. I don't have the de- I should probably have that up on Wikipedia, but uh, it was a very strong event that was happened to face the Earth. Now, if a coronal mass ejection goes somewhere else, doesn't affect Earth, so what? But this one came right straight at Earth. And the magnetic field interacted with our magnetosphere, the Earth's magnetosphere, causing induced currents. When you move a magnetic field, you also create an electric current. And at the time, we had telegraph was our main was our main technology back then. And of course, it blew a lot of the technology, blew a lot of the telegraph wires, just just fried them, right? Uh, because of the compression of the Earth's magnetosphere causing induced currents in the wires. Well, imagine what that would happen, what that would be like today. We've had some activity, solar flares, uh, CMEs hitting the Earth, but nothing, and and they have caused power grid damage. But if if that current gets, when it hits the Earth and it compresses our magnetic field and it interacts with all of our power wires, it will generate a lot of induced current that would overload and blow out a large part large parts of the grid. Well, it's been projected that if the Carrington event happened today, it would be catastrophic, cause hundreds of billions of dollars in damage, and we would be down. I mean, the entire grid would just go down as a result. Now, you follow Tesla a lot. You know a lot about its solar abilities uh, and creating solar power. This is a strong argument for a non-distributed power grid, right? Tesla creating these these localized battery, uh, solar-powered battery uh, units, of which one is in Australia, uh, would not be as affected by this because of the limited range in which they're distributing the power. But we have this nationwide one here in America that would be brought to its knees with a an event like that. Now, I think it was 2018, maybe it was 2017, an event, an eruption happened like that on the sun. It was on the same strength as the Carrington event. But it missed us. We didn't didn't make the news. Didn't you know it? It did it luck it, because it wasn't heading for us. But uh, had it had the sun been rotating just a little bit more our way, it would have hit us. So this is a big danger during solar max, of which we're getting up there in the solar cycle now. It would because of our dependence. On, oh, and the and so let's talk about the effect on the satellites. Uh, obviously, in the first Carrington event, there weren't satellites in orbit. Now there are. And the Earth's magnetic field, especially in low Earth orbit, where Starlink and Kuiper, that's that's Blue Origin's uh, internet system, and all these other satellites are going to live, they are going to be uh, adversely affected if they're not properly shielded. Um, and I don't know that you can shield a satellite enough uh, for that kind of induced current. It'd be like an electromagnetic pulse you read about, like in the in the Matrix, right, where you know it just fries your your electronics. Um, that's the danger. And I don't know to what extent Elon Musk is is uh, shielding his satellites against this stuff, but it is a danger. And solar activity is going to become much more of an issue now. We'll be protected. Physically, biologically, it's not going to hurt our, we're not going to get like mass doses of radiation, but it's going to affect our technology. And Mm -hmm. I remember when 2012 happened, 2012 was the last solar cycle and solar max and Michio Kaku, who I have, I lost all respect for during that time because everybody was freaking out about 2012. Remember that was the Mayan calendar was expiring and all kinds of stuff was happening in 2012 while solar max was happening. He was saying that we were going to be going back to the agrarian days, right? We were going to have to go back to horse and buggy and all this kind of stuff. And I'm thinking we're not just going to suddenly forget how to do technology, right? This was, this, it was the stupidest thing I'd ever heard. We'll repair, rebuild it. It's just going to cost a lot of money, but we're not going to go back to agrarian days and have to be like Quakers on horse and buggy or Amish people running around you know, uh, living off the land. It's like, it was ridiculous how bad it got. So yes, it would be devastating to have a solar flare or solar event eruption. It wasn't a flare. I think it was a CME that, um, that, that would hit us now. It would be quite, uh, catastrophic, uh, to our technology, but, um, you know, not the end of the world. It's not the end of civilization. Mm. Yeah. It's interesting. These sort of events people think as very low probability, 
Um, but it's still good to be aware of them because look at what's happening in 2020. Who would have thought yeah, it's not zero. You know, something like this could happen? Yeah, really oh, fascinating. About the, pand the pandemic, yeah. I mean, exactly, exactly. exactly. Yeah, these are non-zero uh, probability events. They can happen. It's the same with an asteroid uh, strike. You know, a near-Earth To me, one of the most important things NASA is doing is looking up and measuring the, the trajectories of satellites. You hear about it all the time in the news now. Oh, uh, uh, a, a school bus size rock is getting closer to us than any other rock has ever gotten before. Well, those are the kinds of things we need to know. And so I'm happy they're looking, but mm. you know, while the chances are, you know, I don't know, one in you know, maybe a hundred thousand, I don't know uh, what, it, what the, what the odds are of getting hit by one, uh, is not zero, right? We need exactly. to be looking for these kinds of things. And have you seen a, any difference in air quality? Now that so much industry has been sort of shut down and you have so much less cars on the road throughout 2020, have you seen anything from your end? It's been, it's been interesting, actually. Um, I've, seen, I've seen it here. I live in central Florida, and I live in a rural area. So the air quality is almost always pretty good here, um, uh, I mean, comparatively speaking. Um, but you know, I have, I have been to big cities where I've seen, I don't get out much now, obviously either because of the pandemic, but when, when I do get out, yeah, the traffic is less, um, the, uh, the air quality, certainly around, uh, uh, Orlando and Daytona beach and, uh, even Miami, uh, has gotten a lot better. I saw pictures of Beijing where you could actually see Beijing, uh, in the, the smog had been lifted. Um, and things like that. But, um, so yeah, it has made a, it has really helped a lot, I think in terms of, of pollution. It's a, it's astonishing to me mm. how much we're willing to live with, <laughs> you know, it's like, wow, this was really disgusting before. I mean, even cities like Venice in Italy where, uh, the, the water is now clear you, because mm. no one's in Venice right now. And, and, uh, it, you, it's beautiful. It's pristine. It's gone. It's a nature recovers, right? When we, mm. when we, you know, you look at places like Chernobyl where the human beings just vacate the place, nature comes in and reestablishes mm. itself. It's very heartening to me, uh, to see that occur. Right. Um, because we can just go in and decimate a place if, if, you know, when we, when we come in. So, um, yeah, I've seen a lot of improvements over the COVID, um, pandemic in that regard. Yeah. Mm. And as just a final part, can you maybe tell us a bit about yourself and your channel for anyone that's interested to hear more? How could they find you? Yeah, sure. So I've, I started deep astronomy in 2006. Um, and, but now my primary interest and my primary uh, work is uh, Space Junk Podcast. I'm doing this with OPT telescopes, and it's on Spotify and iTunes and everything else. So that's my big uh, focus right now is uh, is that. So please listen to it. Space Junk Podcast comes out. I try to put it out every week. Uh, we talk about amateur astronomy. We talk about telescopes. We talk about life in the universe. Uh, Fraser kane has been on three times. So we've got a lot of lot of different um, things that goes on there. So I hope you guys will listen to it. Nice. Well, Tony, thank you heaps for coming on the show and giving us your <laughs> thoughts on these topics. It's been really in insightful. I love it, man. Ivan, so, dude, I wish you nothing but success. I, I love that you're doing this. And so I'm really glad you're out there making this stuff. And uh, it's really, it's really, uh, I wish you nothing but success. So thanks for having me on. It's been fun. So there you have it. And let me know what you guys think. Will you guys be investing in Starlink if they do an IPO? And what do you guys think about the possibilities of a major solar flare or the Kessler effect happening? Do you guys see this as a major risk or not? Let me know down in the comments and I'd love to chat to you guys there. And on a final note, if you like the content and would like to support the channel, please consider supporting via Patreon. And yeah, I guess until next time, I'll catch you guys soon.